Um, hoping we can get through enough today, by which I mean finish Act 3, um, that after today we, we should only need at most three more days. Because um, I think Act 5 might take two days. Act 4 won't take two days by any means. So we're picking up Uh, we're picking up on page 1646. This is Act 3, Scene 1 still, where Hamlet is talking with Ophelia. Okay? This follows the speech that I tried to make clear, or that I assert at least, is not a soliloquy. Because when Hamlet delivers the to be or not to be speech, Ophelia is somewhere on the stage. And just before he delivered it, <coughs> Claudius and Polonius made clear they were going to listen in, okay? Kind of the only way they could overhear the speech is if they are also somewhere on the stage, even though hidden. And the example I used the other day is, here's the stage. You've got the two doorways here, and they've put curtains so that they're standing there listening. And we're going to hear at the end of this section, it's not a, it's not the end of the scene, um, <clears throat> we're going to hear Claudius come out, and he's going to tell us some things. And I think by the very fact that he tells us what he overheard means he overheard Hamlet's speech. So again, it can't be a soliloquy, because in a soliloquy, none of the other actors no, or excuse me, none of the other characters in the play know anything about what that individual has said. Because the soliloquy is kind of the verbalizing the interior thoughts of the heart slash mind. Okay? So, Hamlet's talking with Ophelia. She's trying to give him back some papers. He says, I never gave those to you. And then he tells her, I think we did this part, you know, I loved you once, I never loved you, etc. Okay? So he says, well, line 112 or so, I did love you once. Indeed, my Lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. You shouldn't have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. Now, look, at, I did this with yesterday's class, and I think most of these glosses are meaningless, but we're going to try. Um, line 115 You've got glosses at the bottom. Okay, so, you should not have believed me, for virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Inoculate. Your gloss says graft, metaphorical. What the hell does that mean? Any of you ever worked at a nursery, not a baby nursery, but a nursery like where you buy plants and stuff, or with tree pruning? Well, you can take a tree, okay, roots down here. You can take a tree, say it's an apple tree. You can cut right there, cut the tree off, and then you can graft on another kind of tree. I've got a tree at home. Um, when we bought it, they, the place that sold it, I remember where it was, advertised it as a fruit cocktail tree. Why? Because it has apricot, peach, and plum. So it's got a trunk, and then grafted onto that trunk are three different kinds of trees. That is, there's a branch coming off here, and there's a branch coming off here, and the trunk goes up, and there's actually another one. It's, there's four. I can't remember the fourth. Apricot, peach, plum, and I think maybe pear. Pear or apple. So one's apricot, one's peach, one's plum, and then let's say this one is apple. So that's grafting. Does that fit in this language? He says, virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock. Stock here means kind of this. Possibly. Our old stock can also mean what? We use a phrase in animal husbandry and sometimes in talking about 
family history, family genealogy, or groups of individuals, they come from good stock. Means what? Good genes. Good genes. Good breeding. You know, the, the very term stock means, eugenics means good genes. Beautiful genes. Okay? Not these kind, DNA kind. Okay? So, we cannot sow, virtue cannot sow inoculate our old stock. So, he doesn't mean this. I don't think he means our old stock, you know, my being virtuous cannot graft onto my family genetic genealogy. So what's he referring to? I think he's going back to this idea, okay? Old stock, the old Adam, that is, Adam of the Old Testament, which St. Paul justify, uh, juxtaposes with the new Adam. He says, just as in one man all sinned and died, or death entered, Adam, so in one man all are made alive, Christ. Okay, There's that grafting kind of idea. So he's using inoculate in kind of our modern sense. What, where do we use that term? I've been fighting off a, an illness since middle of January. Okay, I need a quote-unquote inoculation, something that will stop that illness. That's kind of what he means. So how, do you, how can we do that? Notice he says, virtue can't. What do you mean by virtue? Right behavior, good behavior, cannot so inoculate. And here it means transform this old stock, which in this sense means what? Sinful, fallen humanity. Good behavior can't do what? It can't wipe away the term we used earlier, original sin. That's why I've got this up here. Okay? Later on in the play, Shakespeare is going to make some allusions. Okay? And the allusions are going to be to kind of good works versus faith. This play, I would argue, I do argue, especially when I teach the Shakespeare course, this is the most religious most Christian of all Shakespeare's plays for the simple reason that Shakespeare is embedding in it these debates that are going on at the time that he's writing it. And the debates are between Protestantism and Catholicism. Protestants say you're justified by faith and faith alone, grace, etc. Okay? Catholics, justified by works. You're saved by works, by doing good deeds, etc., etc. Okay? So, virtue cannot so inoculate our old shock, stock, but we shall relish of it, i.e., okay, you've got a footnote down at the bottom, that we do not still have, a, have about us a taste of the old stock, i.e., retain our sinfulness. That is, you can be. Give me an example, if you can think of one. Somebody in the last 20 or 30 years who pretty much everybody looks up to as being a quote-unquote upright, moral, righteous person. Can you think of one? What kind of religious leader would fit that idea? The Pope. Some would say, you know, if you're not Catholic, some would say, evangelicals, Billy Graham. Mother Teresa, who died in 97, same day that uh, Princess Diana died, all right? Very few people say, yeah, but Mother Teresa, you know, she had a hidden agenda. She was all about X, Y, Z. What Hamlet is saying here <coughs> is that even with people like Mother Teresa, the Pope, any Pope, Billy Graham, etc., there is still part of that individual that is sinful. 
That is, there is still part that kind of, in fact, relishes some sinful aspect. You're going to see that same idea, we hope, in a few weeks when we get to um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Minister's Black Veil. Okay? So, good works, good behavior, virtuous living cannot wipe away the stain of sin. Stain, that's what idea have we seen with that? Taint? Taint? We're going to hear when he talks with his mother. Sully? It's, it's the mark. It's a, a mark on an individual. Okay? So, I loved you not. But just a moment ago, he said, I did love you once. Now he says, I loved you not. Why? Is he just, you know, crazy? Is he lying? I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why is he telling her to become a nun? Because that's what that means, get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Breeder of sinners. According to the Catholic doctrine and the Protestant doctrine of original sin, every time okay, a child is born, every newborn baby is sinful. In the medieval Catholic Church, the teaching was that child needs to be baptized soon because if that child dies and goes to hell, this is in the medieval church, if that child dies and goes to hell, that child dies, it will go to hell if it's not baptized. Okay, So that's why you had early, early baptism for babies. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? So if you don't go to a nunnery, if you get married, even if you don't get married, have children, those children will be sinners. Why? Because original sin gets passed down. I myself am indifferent honest. Your gloss tells you indifferent honest means, you know, I'm sometimes virtuous and sometimes I'm not. I'm sometimes chaste and I'm sometimes not. It's like, it's kind of like saying, I'm sometimes pregnant and sometimes not. No, you either are or you aren't. Okay? So, I'm indifferent on this, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not bored me. That is, I could talk about myself, and I could say, I'm pretty bad inside. It would be better if I'd never been born. I'm very, and he tells us some of these things, proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in. More offenses that I could bring out, he says, than I have thoughts to name them. Or imagination to give them shape, to turn those inchoate ideas up here into actions out here in the world, or time to act them. So what's Hamlet really saying about himself? He's kind of expressing. The Calvinistic idea of total depravity. Okay, We'll talk about Calvin. We'll talk about to total depravity when we get to Act 5. Um, what it means essentially is everything we do is colored or tainted by sin. Even if you're helping a little old lady get across the street in busy traffic, there is some sinful element in that. Like, maybe you want to feel better about yourself. Well, that's pride. Okay? Whatever it is. But Hamlet's going on and he's taking that Calvinistic idea of total depravity to the nth degree. He's saying, everything about me is rotten. Okay? 
So, what should such fellows as I do, crawling between earth and heaven? What should, what should we do? He's kind of asking, how should we live? What, what are we going to make of our lives? No, such fellows as I, if others are as rotten as I am. We are errant knaves. Errant means wandering. We lack direction. We lack focus. We lack a destination. We are errant knaves. <coughs> All believe none of us. Now, earlier he told her, you should not have believed me. Now, he says, believe none of us. Who are the us? Is it just people like me that he's kind of alluded to? Or is it believe no men? It's no men. But notice that kind of statement he's just said. Believe none of us. That is what's called... An absolutist statement. Why is it absolutist? It doesn't say believe none of these people, but only that individual in the back. That's not absolutist, because it allows for one. Or believe none of these, but these. That's not absolutist. There's a line in one of the Star Wars films. Only the Sith deal in absolutes. What that means is only a certain kind of people says or say there are absolutes. There are things that are always this way. Okay? What does he say? Believe none of us. Now, take that statement and apply it to the conversation. He's just told her, don't believe men. So what does she do with everything he's telling her? Doesn't believe him. If she takes his words at face value. Don't, don't believe, believe don't believe them. Don't believe what? I did love you once. I never believe I never loved you. So if she doesn't believe those, then I did love you once implies I no longer believe you. If she doesn't believe him now, is Hamlet kind of surreptitiously, subversively trying to tell Ophelia? You know, if you if you um, watch the Stranger Things series, Netflix, there's a scene when the, the one kid's being possessed by the smoke monster, whatever it is, and they're trying to get him to communicate, and he won't, and his fingers are doing this. And he's tapping out Morse code. That is, the part of him that's still there deep inside is tapping out Morse. He's, he's essentially saying, help, help, help. Is this Hamlet's kind of way of, while talking to Ophelia, he's tapping out, don't believe me, I still love you. Yes. I think so. Okay. Why is he doing that? Because I think he knows He's being watched. He's being listened to. And so he's trying to tell her, don't believe a word of what I'm telling you. This is all part of, I would argue, his putting on an antic disposition because he knows somebody else is watching. How do, why do I say that? Believe none of us. Go that way to a nunnery. <coughs> Where's your father? Why in the world would he bring up her father at this point? Have, have they been talking about her father? Nope. What have they been talking about? I thought you loved me. I did love you once. I didn't love you. Oh, but your letters, man. Oh, they reeked of love. I mean, they, they really did a good job on me. Where's your father? At home, my lord. True or false? False. She's lying through her teeth. She knows exactly where he is. He's right back here. Hamlet and Ophelia are like right here. <laughs> you know, and if I were directing, I would have, you know, Hamlet and Ophelia facing each other like this so that the edge of the stage is here and 
the doorway with the heiress is back here. So then when he asks, where's your father? She kind of glances to where he's hiding. At home, my Lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. So is he telling Ophelia, well, next time you run home and see your daddy, <laughs> tell him, keep his nose out of my business and to be a fool in his own house. Ostensibly, that's what he's doing. I think he's saying, Polonius, don't get in my business. This is the warning. If it were, you know, the naval battle, this is a shot across the bow. He's kind of saying, next one, it's coming amidships. I'm going to sink you. All right? How do I know? When he does kill Polonius, we're going to see. What does he say? He calls him a fool for not sticking his nose in his own business or keeping his nose in his own business. Oh, help him, sweet heavens. She's asking God, help Hamlet. Why? Because I think she understands a little bit about what he just said. I think she understands Hamlet just issued a warning. Okay? So, but, okay, if you do marry let me give you this plague for a dowry. A dowry is what the father gives along with the daughter into the marriage. A bank account, a check, okay? Or it could be a blessing. What kind of blessing is he going to give? He calls it a plague. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Chaste as ice. Chase their mean, not virginal, but pure. Because sex within marriage is, is considered chaste. Any sex outside marriage, outside marriage is considered unchaste. So he's saying if your marriage is so pure that you actually don't have sex, okay? because the two images that he uses are used how in popular culture to, to describe certain women frigid just you know cold as ice there's a foreigner song I think it's foreigner. so he says you won't escape calumny calumny is a bad reputation no matter how chaste you are you're still gonna get a bad rep why get thee to a nunnery go farewell or if thou wilt needs marry marry a fool for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them and you've got a gloss there. And the monsters he's talking about are is this idea in the Middle Ages that because women, the idea was, couldn't be faithful to their husbands, they'd go off and sleep with other people. They turned their husbands into monsters by giving them these horns on their head. It's, it's not demonic or satanic or anything like that. It just means, and you see this represented physically in woodcut illustrations and books, <coughs> Um, you know, some guy sitting in his home, and he's got these little horns, and he's got his wife going out the door. Meaning, the horns are going to get bigger, because she's going out the door to see another friend, okay? <clears throat> Boyfriend, lover. So, marry a fool. Why? Because a fool won't realize it. Wise men, however, no. She's going to cheat on me. Go. To a nunnery, quickly. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. I've heard of your, and he doesn't stop. I've heard of your paintings, too. What paintings? Makeup. That's what he means, cosmetics. God hath given you one face. This is line 136. And you make yourselves another. I mean, this is, you know, 400 years before plastic surgery. You were born this way, but you pile on the makeup so you look this way. You jig, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go, go to, I'll no more on it. It has made me mad. I will say we will have no more marriage. 
And those that are married already, all but one show reverence. That is, but we're not going to stop them from living, except for one. Who's the one? Claudius is going to die. That is, that marriage is going to get broken. Okay? So Hamlet leaves. And Ophelia has a little speech. Is it a soliloquy? No. Probably not, because they're there. And listen to what she says. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. That is, cast down. The courteous soldier scholar's eye, tongue, sword. She means Hamlet is the model of behavior. He's the model to be emulated for all men in the Danish society. He is the ideal courtier, that is, knight. He's the ideal soldier. Okay. Courtier also meaning, uh, you know, government, functionary government official. Okay. He's the ideal scol uh, scholar. The expectancy and rose of the fair state. Expectancy, why? Because he's the prince. He's the future king. Everybody looks to Hamlet to keep the kingdom going and such. And rose meaning he will be the perfect bloom. He will be the when he becomes king, we will now finally see how a king ought to be. The glass of fashion, glass means mirror. If you're really concerned about how you appear, what do you do before you leave your home in the morning? You look in the mirror. You make sure everything's just right. So anybody who's concerned about fashion, they look at Hamlet. He's the mold of form, that is, he's the very shape that everybody wants to have the shape of every man, in essence. He is the observed of all observers. Now, notice when she calls him the observed of all observers, there's nothing negative about that. Why is he, within her speech, the observed of all observers. Everyone was up and down. Yeah. Everybody goes, man, I wish I could be like that. It's not. Everybody's going, everybody's going, oh, what's Hamlet up to? Let's spy on Hamlet. That's not the meaning of that line. Okay. I don't know if there's somebody, you know, in culture that you, that people look up to, I'm sure there are for some individuals, whether actor or whatever but it's that kind of individual and I of ladies most deject and wretched why is she of all ladies most deject and wretched because he said he loved me and now he says he doesn't that is now she's dejected and because she's dejected she feels wretched she feels miserable go back to Hamlet's non-soliloquy and he talks about the heartache and thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to and later on he talks about the pangs of despised love it's almost like when he says that speech if he walks out the door and he just you know glances and sees almost through a blink of an eye Ophelia that he says this because maybe he knows what he's going to say to her later. I loved you once. I didn't really. I don't love you. There, how's it feel? How's the pangs of despised love to feel? Okay? She goes on. Why is she most dejected and wretched? Because she sucked the honey of his music vows. That is, she read that poetry. She read those songs he wrote for her. And, I mean... Suck those suckers dry. Why? Because they were full of meaning. They were so sweet. And now she sees that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh. That unmatched form, his form, unmatched by anybody else, 
in feature of blown youth. And you've got a little gloss there, blooming youth. I mean, they look at him and phew. Now, blasted with ecstasy. Ecstasy, your gloss tells you, madness. The word literally means an out-of-body experience, where the soul leaves the body. Well, yeah, that would be madness, right? For the body. That, I mean, the body would be done, essentially. Woe is me, to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. What does she mean, to have seen what I have seen? Because it has both a past tense and a present tense meaning. To have seen what I've seen, Hamlet in his prime. Hamlet when everybody looked up to him. Whew. Right? Almost like when Hamlet in his first soliloquy talks about his father compared to Claudius. A Hyperion to a satyr. That's Hamlet as he was to Hamlet as he is now. Because Hamlet as he is now is kind of subhuman. He lost his mind. Right? To see what I see. To have seen what I've seen in the past and now she's like my world is totally upside down. Well what did Hamlet say to his friends when he talked about Denmark? It's a stale lifeless promontory. He gets nothing. She's kind of saying because of what's happened to Hamlet Denmark for Ophelia is now becoming a prison. Why? What did Hamlet say to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Thinking something is what makes it so. King and Polonius come in. I've got to go a lot faster. Love? No. His affections do not that way. No. Affections there means emotions and what's called the affective faculty of his, of his personality. His ability to make decisions and do something. No, 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 no. It's not love. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. See, he can't be referring only to Hamlet's conversation with Ophelia. He's got to be referring to Hamlet's whole speech at the, from the beginning of the to be or not to be. Okay? Though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. Well, what did Polonius already say when he kind of accosted Hamlet? Though there be, though this be madness, yet there is method in it. In other words, he's like, he sounds crazy, but there's a logic to his craziness. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood. What kind of language is sits on brood? What kind of animal do we talk about brooding? Hens. They brood on their eggs. For what purpose? To stay them warm. Keep them warm and keep going. So they'll hatch. That term, that verb, gets used in the King James Bible, by the way, to talk about the Holy Spirit brooding over the face of the deep in the creation story. So, no, his melancholy sits on brood over what? Something in his soul. So what's Claudius saying? Whatever's in his soul, it's going to do what? It's going to hatch. It's, it's, it's being brooded on. If we talk about somebody who's brooding, what do, what do we mean? We mean there's something going on inside that they're doing what with? They're feeding it. If you try to get over a problem, you don't sit there and dwell on it. If you're wanting to really enjoy that problem, you throw yourself, modern terminology, a pity party. All right. So, he says, and I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. That is, the hatching and the disclosing, the uncovering of this problem, it's going to be dangerous. To whom? 
after me. Which to prevent, I have in quick determination, thus set it down. Hamlet's going to England. Notice, the first reason he says, and this is it, to send Hamlet to England, to get the, the tribute, to demand the tribute that England owes us. That's the neglected tribute. Why? Change of venue, change of scenery, might do what for Hamlet? Make them feel better. Why do students in the Northeast go to Daytona or Fort Lauderdale or Panama City for spring break? It's not freaking cold, okay? Warmer weather, the beach, etc. Okay? What's the point? We often try to think, or we often think, when things are going really, really, really bad, when your life totally sucks, what? Leave. Go somewhere else. You can get away from your problems. Sometimes maybe that's true. Maybe you have an abusive spouse. Get the hell out of the house. That can solve the problem. Sometimes, however, like with Hamlet, what if the problems are inside? Then you carry them wherever you go. So... He says, I'm hoping fresh sea air, you know, little travel around England might do him some good, might help him feel better. All right? What do you think? He asked Polonius. Polonius, yeah, 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 you can go ahead and do that. I still think it's love. I still think it's because I told my daughter to reject him. King says, okay. Madness and great ones must not unwatch go. Why? Give me a 20th century example of a great one whose madness went unwatched. And hell of a lot of people paid the consequences. Hitler, 1930s. Only one person in the quote-unquote Western industrialized world paid any real attention to anything Hitler said. Winston Churchill in England. And he was outside government at the time. Nobody listened to him. He was like, you know, he's over there. He's building up his military. He's building up his army. He's building up his air force. He's got tanks just rolling out of the factories. He's building an army. You usually only build up an army for what purpose? War. To use it. We should do something. No, no, no. You're being a warmonger, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great ones. I'm not saying Hitler was morally great. I mean, great in the simple sense, he had a profound impact on people's lives, whether good or bad. I mean, if you were German in the 1930s, it was a good impact. Why? He brought them out of the Depression. See, the, the Great Depression was worldwide. It wasn't just the United States. He brought Germany out of the Depression long before the United States got out. In fact, you could one sense say he brought us out of the Depression, too. Because FDR's New Deal did nothing, absolutely nothing, to end the Great Depression. It was World War II that ended the Great Depression. Why? Because the government started printing blank checks to do what? Build airplanes, build bombers, build tanks, recruit troops, the whole nine yards. Okay? Scene two, which I'm going to skip most of. Hamlet talks to the players to um, tell them how he wants them to play this, perform this little play he's given them. Okay? Many scholars think that's Shakespeare telling the actors how to do his lines. Don't go in there wild gesticulation, you know. Speak the lines trippingly on the tongue as I have shown you. And he's also, he also takes some dig at child actors there. Okay? Quit screwing up my lines, boys, essentially. Okay? So, Horatio comes in, Polonius comes in, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in, and we get the play within the play. Okay? Bottom of 1650. I'm going to try to do this real quickly. I'm not even going to be very oblique. We get some of Shakespeare's dirtiest language. B 
beginning around line 95 and going through, I don't know, line 105, 110. How so? Gertrude sits down and she says, Hamlet, come sit next to me. And he says, no, mother, here's metal more attractive. And he points at Ophelia. Meaning, like he's a magnet, and he's drawn to her. Polonius, how did you see that? I tell you, it's my daughter. Okay? And Hamlet goes to Ophelia and says, Lady, shall I lie in your lap? And he lies down on the ground and puts his head in her lap. She, almost before he even physically does that, she responds to his, Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, just a public place here. Because she's thinking where she would be lying and he would be lying on her. I mean, my head upon your lap. I, my lord. Well, head has two references, right? It has one physical and then it has a slang use in the English language. She goes, yeah, I know what you meant. In other words, Ophelia's telling us here, I get your dirty double entendre but I'm not going to play your game. Hamlet, oh, you think I meant country matters? In Shakespeare's day, I used to work on an edition of poetry of a Renaissance poet, contemporary Shakespeare's, guy for whom we have the most manuscript evidence of his poems. Over 5,000 copies of this guy's poems, John Donne's poems, survive in handwritten manuscripts. Almost every time when I would go through a manuscript, and find the word country, it was spelled this way. And in Shakespeare's day, it's pronounced country, not country. Okay? So whenever you get a Renaissance poet who uses that word country, you need to look at the context and go, is there any way this can be a double entendre or a dirty usage? Because if there is, the poet intended that. In, intended that meaning. Why? Because they're all a bunch, for the most part, of mid-twenties, university graduates, and they're trying to see who can be the dirtiest without being overtly the dirtiest. That is, who can drag more people's minds into the gutter and make them go, damn, that's pretty smart. Okay? So, you thought I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. Hamlet takes that nothing and says, now that's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. She's like, what? Nothing? Well, how do you represent nothing? With a zero, a O, a hole? Well, there's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. Again, Hamlet's, you know. But who hears this? The audience does. But I think it's primarily Hamlet and Ophelia. I don't think Gertrude's over there going, Ham, Hamlet, stop this. You stop right now. Okay? Maybe Horatio, he's going, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this, Hamlet. You know? Okay? So we get the play within the play. And what do we see? Claudius freaks out. Claudius freaks out. Why? Because in the dumb show part, we see the one guy pour the poison into the other guy's ear, and then Hamlet says, and then he goes and marries the dead king's wife. You know, that's when Claudius gets up and leaves. Okay? Called the mousetrap, by the way. The other name is the murder of Gonzaga. So, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come up to Hamlet. Got three minutes, see if I can finish this. Come up to Hamlet after that. And Hamlet, when the players come in, takes a recorder from a player. You know, recording it learned in grade school. And he gives it to Rosencrantz and says, gives it to Gildenstern. says, play this. He, I can't. Come on, play it. I, I don't know how. Come on, just play it. I, I, you put it to your mouth, you put your fingers over the holes, and you blow, and it makes a pretty noise. I, I don't know how. And Hamlet smacks him, if I were a director. He'd smack him on the head with it and say, and yet you think you can play on me. You can get the depth of my sounds. Oh, you're not even close. Okay? So, scene three. God, we're not going to get through this. Damn, damn, damn. Polonius tells the king, 
I'll have the, the queen send Hamlet to come up to her room so that she'll talk to him. And I will hide behind the heiress in her room. Hide in the closet. King says, cool. Okay? So that, that, that happens. Hamlet starts to make his way to his mother's room. In the meantime, he walks by and sees Claudius. And what's Claudius doing? He's down on his knees and he's praying. He's had a big, long soliloquy. Hamlet comes in. He sees him praying. And Hamlet's like, now I can do it. Why doesn't he kill him then? Because if you're praying when you're repenting, you're going to have to do it. I mean, if he's saying, oh, God, forgive me, a sinner. He goes to heaven. And Hamlet's like, that's not revenge. My dad burns in purgatory every day. No, no, no. He's going to get him win. When he's, when he's, drunk, when when he's, he's drunk, drunk or in bed with Hamlet's mother. He's going to get him in the act of sin, which will go, not to purgatory, to hell. To hell. Dad's at least in purgatory. Okay, so we will pick up uh, at the beginning of, uh, not at the beginning. We'll pick up when Hamlet goes into his mother's room on 1660.